Good morning! It's Jamie from Not So Wimpy Teacher, and we're back for another day of the Not So Wimpy Teacher Experience. The Not So Wimpy Teacher Experience. Wow, we've been having so much fun. There have been trainings every weekday in July, and we, we started off talking about grammar and spelling and vocabulary. And this week we've been talking a lot about writing. So very excited. I want you to go ahead and get in the comments and tell me where you are watching from. Tell me where you're watching from in the comments. So if you're joining for the first time, you've happened upon this, the Natural MP Teacher Experience is a fun virtual event that we're hosting for teachers in grades two through five. And we've been doing a training every weekday morning. We've been doing all kinds of giveaways of gift cards and resources for your classroom. We've had special promotions and games. It's been lots of fun. And we're only halfway through. Our little secret next week is going to be really big. So if you haven't already put this on your calendar for next week, same time next week, noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Um, Pacific time. Make sure you have it on your calendar for next week because next week's my birthday and I like to celebrate big. I do not go small and I always celebrate my birthday with you because that's so much fun. So I have pretty big plans for lots of gifts for you um, and some surprises along the way. So you definitely want to join us next week for each of our trainings. All right, Southern Tiffany's watching from Southern Oregon and she's gonna be teaching third grade for the first time. Thank you, Megan. Stacy's joining us from Texas and Renee from Ohio. Stacy has a July birthday as well. Stacey, I hope you live somewhere where the weather's nicer in July. July birthdays here in Phoenix are kind of a bummer. It's like 110 degrees today. So Beth, make sure you join next week because lots of fun stuff for your birthday and my birthday. All right. Carol's joining us from Missouri and Christy also from Missouri. All right. All over the country. So exciting. If you need to check this out, here's the calendar for the month. So if you have not signed up yet, please make sure you go and do so. That's how you'll get a copy of this calendar, a copy of the game board. You'll get reminders. You will get notifications about special promotions for you. So go to notsomebeteacher.com forward slash experience if you have not done so already, because that's how you get signed up. Super important you get signed up. Now, if you're looking at the calendar, today we're talking about tips for simple writing conferences. And tomorrow we're going to talk about editing student writing. Two very hot topics. The next week I told you is the big week. Make sure you're coming next week. I have a special announcement on Monday too. So that's going to be a good one to be at. And then the last week of July, we are ending the National Movie Teacher Experience by talking all about math. So that'll be fun. I'm looking for my teacher friend that was having lunch here in Queen Creek yesterday at a little Mexican restaurant. I ran into someone and she was so excited because she's been coming to the teacher experience every single day. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my friend who I saw at lunch yesterday. I bet she's here watching. Okay. Make sure you sign up. Are we ready? Are we ready to get started for today? Tips for simple writing conferences. So tell me what word comes to mind when I say writing conferences. And you can be completely honest. What word comes to mind? What comes to your head when you hear writing conferences? I mean, for me in those early years, I would have said dread, time consuming. I really didn't look forward to writing conferences because honestly, I had no idea what I was doing. Overwhelming, ugh, time consuming, extra planning. Yeah, this is exactly what I would have said in those first several years because I was doing it wrong. And so I was making it overwhelming. And oh yeah, not enough time to get to everyone. Yes, I totally felt that. Yikes, that's a good one. I can't get to everyone. Yes, I felt exactly like this. So if that's you, if you're feeling something like that, you're in the right place because I felt all of these same things until I changed the way that I was doing writing conferences and I made them so much easier for me, but also incredible 
incredibly effective for my students. So that's what we're that's what we're chatting about today. Okay. <laughs> I love your words. You're making me laugh over here. It's hard to do a training while y'all are making me laugh. <laughs> okay, constant interruptions. That's a good one. Okay, why do we want to do writing conferences? Because I can see that you're like, oh, this is not something I want to do. And I felt that as well. So let's chat about why we want to be doing them. First of all, it is the best way to provide differentiation. Every single one of our writers does not need the exact same support or extension. And so when we conference with our students, we're able to provide that unique feedback that that student needs. All right, we love to differentiate. Also, it allows you to get feedback early. I don't know about you, but because I hated conferencing and because I was so terrible at it, I wouldn't see student writing for a long period of time. And then, you know, they turn in their opinion essay and I would be really bummed out to find out it was actually a personal narrative. You know, they wrote about the time they went to a baseball game with their dad instead of why baseball was the greatest sport ever. And we'd already spent so much time on these essays only for me to find out late in the game that they were way off track. They weren't even writing the same genre. That's a real bummer. So we want to make sure that we get to give feedback early and often and conferences can allow that. Okay. Students learn from each other. I'm going to chat a little about this, but the way I do conferences, students can be learning from one another. And then I really like this one. I learned over the years that students enjoy sharing the writing. Not every single student, because I'm sure someone will say, oh, I had this one girl, she didn't like to share writing. And yes, there will always be um, a couple of students who are very shy about sharing the writing, especially in the beginning of the year. But the majority of your writers, the reason they write is to share. That's a huge reason that authors write, is to share. When we have conferences, they get more opportunities to share with you. And a lot of our students are so excited about that. They want you to see what they're writing about. They're proud of what they have written and they want someone to read it or hear it. And so conferencing gets that, gives them that high. And that's really important because we want to feed into that. It helps them to love writing. If they never get to share the writing or don't feel like they get to share it enough, then they're not going to enjoy writing. But you guys said it. And I asked you, what do you think about when I say writing conferences? So many of you said it's time consuming. How am I going to get to everyone? Not enough time in the day. I hear you. So this is what I was doing. And tell me if this sounds fairly similar to what you've done. I would give my mini lesson, which wasn't all that many. If you've heard me chat about mini lessons earlier in the week, I didn't know what I was doing there. So my lessons weren't all that many. I would send my students back to their writing spots to write. And then I would call one student back to my desk to conference. Now, I usually told students the day before that their conference was going to be the next day and they would give me their writing ahead of time. And the plan was that I would take it home and read it ahead of time so that I could come to the conference totally prepared with brilliant feedback. Well, one, I quickly learned that I hated taking writing home every single day. I mean, that was just way too much for me. I quickly got out of the habit, like I never got in the habit actually, but I quickly stopped doing it. You know, at first you have all these great intentions and you're reading them and you're writing down feedback, but a little ways in, I was like, oh, I'll just do it in the morning. I'll just do it during the conference. And so that didn't work. I don't know if any of you've tried that, but anyway, I tried one, I'd have one student come back and I would do a lot of the talking. I would tell them like, I would show them the writing and maybe I had taken my pen and, and marked it up a little bit and I would do so much of the talking. I would tell them like, oh, you know, maybe you need to add a, a different lead and I notice you use this word a lot and I notice there's not paragraphs, maybe you could do this. Hey, have you ever thought about adding something like this or that? And I'm, I'm telling them how to make this piece of writing better. And one thing I noticed, they were overwhelmed. They gave me their writing thinking it was a masterpiece and I came back telling them how many things they should fix and I gave them a long list of things to fix 
um, this conference would end up taking a long time. So in my head, I thought I was going to meet with like five kids a day, but it usually was one or two when all was said and done because my mini lesson was too long because I spent too long with each individual student. Um, I didn't meet with very many students and it just didn't seem like a very good use of our time. I did not look forward to it. And so a lot of times I would skip them all together and just kind of walk around and monitor the class while they were writing. This seemed easier to me, but I was missing out on getting to read all of their writing until I had this aha moment. Guys, if there's one subject that you really feel like you're super effective at, you're like, I'm a really good reading teacher. I'm a really good math teacher, whichever subject it might be for you. Take a moment, grab a journal and make a list of what do you do in that subject that you think makes you so effective? I did this activity once and I said, I am really great with math, um, which surprised me because I wasn't, I didn't consider myself a great math student when I was in school, but I really was effective with math. And so I made a list of like, why do I think I'm so effective at math? And one of the things that came up for me when I wrote out this list is that I used small groups to help differentiate. And that was my big aha moment. I'm like, whoa, I'm not doing that in writing. Why not? I actually do it in reading and math. Why suddenly in writing do we not use small groups to differentiate? And it was just this aha moment. So the secret to fitting them all in, the secret to getting a chance to help more students all at once and to see their writing more often, it's group conferences. I was trying to do it one-on-one, -on -one, but that does take a really long time. And so group conferences were the answer. Group conferences were like the small groups I was doing in math and reading. All right, let me go in a little bit deeper about how I used these group conferences in my writing block. First of all, who should have a conference? Everyone. I often hear teachers say like, oh, I try to meet with my struggling writers. And I get it because if you're doing it one-on-one -on -one and you're trying to fit your whole class in, that is so challenging. And because that's so challenging, you try to meet with fewer students so that you can get the most bang for your time, right? And I get that. But the reality is that our excelling writers, they still want to grow, even though they are maybe on level or even slightly above level, they still should be able to grow this year. And don't forget, they love to share their writing too. That's why they write. And so conferences should be for everyone. Now, conference groups. How did I make the conference groups? At the beginning of the year, I gave a on-demand writing assessment. I like to do an on-demand writing assessment at the beginning of each unit. So when I start my personal narrative unit, I give one. When I start an informational unit, I'll give another. But I would just give them a prompt that they could all respond to and um, just give them one day's worth of writing time to do their best. I would then take their rubric and score it, although this would never go on their report card because I would consider this to be a pre-test would never go on a report card, but I would use this to help group students with similar needs. So usually you got to go with your gut because if you overthink it, you can, and you'll be tempted to, you will doubt yourself, but you start looking at the rubrics and it becomes really obvious. You will see students who scored zero on the majority of the rubric. Yeah, they need to be in a group together. There's going to be some others who scored a little bit higher. Maybe they stayed in the ones, occasionally had a zero, occasionally a two. Okay, those can be in a group. You're going to start seeing some students who had more twos than ones, and they can be in a group. But you can also look at the type of skills. All right, this person doesn't even know what a personal narrative is. They can be in a group all together versus these students knew what a personal narrative was, but they just need to, you know, start adding some dialogue and some more interesting words. Okay, they can be in a group. Don't overthink it because these groups can change. They can be very fluid. If you put a student in a conference group and you later realize that's not the right conference group for them, it's easy to move them. So what I'm saying is, Go with your gut at first 
and then make changes where you feel like they're necessary. And you will move people around throughout the year because students who do really well in personal narrative don't always do really well in fiction narrative or in informational. They can do well in one genre and not another. So conference groups, don't overthink it, but give them a simple prompt at the beginning of the year and use that prompt to put together your first set of groups. Now you're going to want to have a schedule of when you meet with each of your groups. Here's the difference between how I did reading groups and math groups. In reading groups and math groups, I was meeting with groups multiple times per week. But with writing, I decided to only meet with one group per day, just one. So I could only have as many groups as days in the week that I was doing my writing workshop. That way I could meet with every student every week. So if you teach writing workshop four days per week, then you can have four groups, which means you need to divide your class into four. So people ask how many kids should be in each group. It's going to depend on how large your group is and how many days per week you're teaching writing workshop. I love to suggest that teachers teach writing workshop at least four days per week. And um, if you do that, you might have, you'll have your Monday group, your Tuesday group, your Wednesday group, and your Thursday group. You only need to meet with one per day. You don't want to meet with more than that because it just adds chaos. You start to rush and feel like you can't get enough in. I don't like that feeling. So just one per day. If you only do writing workshop three times per week, then you need to divide your group your class into three groups. They don't have to be perfectly equal groups, but they should be similar in size because you don't want to have one group with 10 kids and one group with three kids. You want to try and get them in the similar range. But if you only have writing workshop three times per week, you only have three groups. Maybe you teach writing workshop Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Then you're going to have a Monday group, a Tuesday group, and a Thursday group. Okay, and I would just display this somewhere in your classroom, or you can even have a PowerPoint slide that you just keep up on the board during this time. And it would just say Monday group and list the students in that group. And then Tuesday, the same thing. And what I used to do is I made a, a poster that just said Monday writing group and Tuesday writing group and another one that said Wednesday writing group. I printed them, laminated them, and then I used dry erase or wet erase marker to write the students' names. That way it was so easy for me to switch a student from one group to another if I felt it made more sense. Okay, so you only have to meet with one group per day. When do we do this? We do this after the mini lesson. This is why it is so essential that we're keeping those mini lessons mini. We talked about that earlier this week. And if you did not attend that training, make sure you watch the replay. If you signed up for the event, we send replay links every Friday. You can also find all of the trainings on our YouTube channel. But we want to keep the mini lesson short because the most important time of writing workshop is actually the students writing when they are actually writing. That is when you're going to pull your one group. Another reason you don't want to meet with these groups more than once per week is that when you're meeting with them, you are taking away from their independent writing time. Now, we're going to make it really valuable time because we're going to be giving feedback and learning and growing. But if we were pulling them back multiple times per week, we would really be interfering with their opportunity to keep writing in their masterpiece. So while your students are doing their independent writing task, and if you're not familiar with this, we talked about independent writing this week as well. And that independent writing task, you can watch Monday's training for that and um, catch the replay out on our YouTube channel. But the independent writing task is a short task to be done in 10 minutes or less that was directly related to your mini lesson. It's easy for everyone to accomplish and be successful that day. Instead of just saying, okay, students, go write which is very overwhelming to most our writers, especially our struggling writers. Instead of doing that, we're doing a mini lesson maybe on um, our leads and we give them a strategy for writing a lead and then their independent task for that day might be to go and write one example of this particular type of lead that they could use in their fiction narrative. And they go back to their desk to write that one sentence. When they finish, they can work on their second story. If you're not familiar with this, make sure you check out Monday's training, which was so good. It was three secrets to turn your, your writers into thriving and excited writers. So the thing about the conference is that it's only 10 to 15 minutes. Don't You don't want to have to go over 15 minutes. And I shoot for 10. 
my students are writing for about 20 minutes. So if I do a 10 minute writing conference, I still have time to walk around the class and do desk side conferences where necessary, which means if I've met with a group and I realize one student is struggling even more, I can stop by their desk and check in with them. If a student was absent and they missed their conference or they missed a couple mini lessons, I can stop by their desk and check in with them and make sure that they're catching up. So that's why I keep the conference even shorter than my students' independent writing training. Thank you, Carolyn. She said Monday's training was awesome. It was one of my favorites. Okay, let's take a, just a short break and give away some TPT gift cards because I love giveaways. Tell me in the comments, what is your favorite genre of writing to teach? Is it personal narrative or maybe it's fiction narrative? Maybe it's informational or it's opinion persuasive or uh, maybe it's poetry. So some teachers really like poetry. It was my least favorite to teach, but maybe it's your favorite. Uh, maybe it's um, your reading response. Maybe you prefer that. Tell me in the comments. I'm just going to pick some random winners to receive some TBT gift cards that you can put towards your TBT back to school wish list. All right. Let me grab a couple here. Uh, Cynthia. Cynthia says personal narrative is her favorite. Cynthia, there's something so fun about getting to read stories about your actual students. It's just such a great way to get to know your students and what they love and what they don't like. So I can totally see how fun personal narrative is. Cynthia, send us a gift or send us an email, jamie at notsomewimpyteacher.com, and we will send you a $5 gift card to put towards your TBT wish list. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay. What? Let's, let's look for another one here. All right. Tara says she likes to teach opinion and persuasive. I feel like I can use it a lot as an adult. Yeah, it's a really great skill to teach students, isn't it? And I find that even in these younger grades, they absolutely love being asked what their opinion is. I think as a kid, so often you are told what to think, but when you're doing opinion, you get to tell other people what you think. It's so fun. Tara, I agree. All right, send me an email, jamie at notsomewimpyteacher.com, and we will get you a $5 TPT gift card to put towards your wish list. Thank you, Tara. Oh, Molly says, my favorite genre has got to be fiction narrative. Molly, that is awesome. Some of our students absolutely love fiction narrative because they get to be uber creative. When I was a kid, I loved to write fiction narratives. So I loved it when our teachers gave us that kind of time. Love it. They can be really challenging for other students too. So you have to have some really strong mini lessons to help them along. Molly, go ahead and send me an email, jamie at notjustawimbyteacher.com, and we'll send you a gift card for TPT. Thank you for uh, joining us, Molly. All right, I'm looking for one more. All right. How about Pam? Pam says she loves to teach informational. Students love picking their topics and researching. Oh, you just hit it. I think students do enjoy doing informational when they get to pick their topics because they're researching something they already have some sort of interest in and they get so excited. I have had students who have done an informational report and then the rest of the year, every time they go to the library, they look for books on that topic. They can't get enough. So fun to see them get excited. Pam, send me an email. Uh, Jamie at notsomewimpyteacher.com, and we will send you a gift card to put towards your TBT wish list. Thanks, Pam. Okay, guys, I have a really big giveaway at the end of the training. So if you didn't win yet, hold on, because I've got a pretty big giveaway coming up, all right? I love seeing all these different genres that you enjoy teaching. Okay, now what are you gonna do in the conference? Let's let's switch gears and let's get back to talking about conferences. Um, I used to make this so hard on myself, right? I would read each individual. First of all, I was reading their writing, which was like really challenging. And then I was trying to come up with things to tell them. And I found this really challenging, especially in my early years of teaching, when I didn't really know what would make their writing better. Sometimes I read their writing and I'm just like, I don't know. I, I can tell it's not very good, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what would make it better. And I just really struggled. And I later realized that I'm, 
if I'm giving a great mini lesson in the group conference to simplify things, I really just need to think of it as checking in with them. So I can check on an independent task that they already did. If I gave an independent task yesterday of adding um, dialogue in one spot of their story. Now today, they can each take turns going around the group, reading the spot where they added dialogue. Do you notice now they are reading? So that's huge. Not me reading it, but they're reading it to me. They can actually read their handwriting better than I can. Even when they can't read their handwriting, they can still read it better than me. But also, I'm only asking them to read one small section because if you ask them to read the whole story, that eats into our time. So they're getting to share a spot in their story, like spotlight something that they're proud of. So if you taught last week, you taught them um, using, you're doing informational reports, and you taught them to use vocabulary terms, then today you can ask them in their group to go around one by one and share two different vocabulary terms they added and share the sentences where they added it. So that you're checking to see that they did the task and understood the task. After they read, if you're like, wow, that went really well, you can send them back to work on that day's independent task. If you have just one or two who might need some extra support, they can stay at the table. You can also teach a mini lesson that the whole class didn't need. Maybe when you did your your pre your pre assessment, your on demand assessment, you notice that almost the whole class already knew how to do a skill. There was just a few students who didn't. You could teach that as a mini lesson in your small group instead of your whole group. And of course, always use that pre assessment as a guide. But my very favorite thing to do in, in the small groups that was just really beneficial to my students was checking in on a task they already completed. So I already taught this to them. Now I'm checking in. Now, if we go to check in and I realize, wow, they just didn't get it. We get out the anchor chart that we worked on and we go over it, give a couple more examples and, and help them to fix it during that group conference. So I feel like we are taking one really small piece of the writing and we are making it better during the group conference. We're not trying to focus on the whole writing. That's where I got so overwhelmed. That's where it started to take way too much time for me. We're just focusing in on one small skill. And I feel like my students would leave feeling proud of themselves and more confident because of the fact that we're only focusing on a small portion of the writing. All right. These are example topics, but I mean, you can screenshot this if you want, but the reality is these are just topics you would probably do mini lessons on. So anything you might have already done a mini lesson on can easily become a group conference topic. And a lot of times you can choose the same topic for the whole week. So maybe you taught dialogue last week. So this week in your group conferences, you're going to be checking in on dialogue with your Monday group, your Tuesday group, your Wednesday group, your Thursday group. The only time you might not teach the exact same skill in your small group for every day is if you just already know from the pre-assessments that you only have one or two groups who need the extra support in that area. This actually tends to be somewhat rare uh, because a lot of our writers have not been exposed to these mini lessons. A lot of our writers have had writing instruction in the past that was like, just write. And so I find that even my strong writers are missing so many of these skills. And so I put a list of topics because it helps people to understand what I'm talking about, but really any of your mini lessons easily can become your small group topic. I would just do it the week after or a couple days after you taught it so that you can check in on that task. You can have them prove to you, show to you in their writing that they've done it, or they say, honestly, I didn't know how to do that. And it allows you to help them. So I have a lot of teachers um, who will tell me that, you know, they've done every other thing that I've taught them about writing workshop, but they're still too scared to start the writing conferences. And I think that the reason is that they've had bad experiences in the past, but also because just like me, they're worried, like when they get this piece of writing, that they're not going to know exactly what to say to make the writing better. And it feels overwhelming sometimes because writing there there isn't just this list like if you do x y and z your writing will be good it's a, it's a little more based on opinion right and i know that this scared me in a lot it scares a lot of teachers so really want you to change the way you think about conferences it's not like you fixing their writing that's not what it should be it should be a lot less of you talking and more of them talking think of the conference as just your opportunity to check 
for understanding of the mini lesson. You gave a mini lesson, now you just want to check and see if they understood it. So have them read to you where they demonstrated that skill in their writing. And if they didn't and weren't able to, then you can go back to that mini lesson and give a few more examples to help them get on track. Will every student master every single skill that you teach, even if you are using groups? No. And that's not really a fair goal. I think that sometimes we set that as our goal as teachers, but it's really not fair. Every student in your class isn't ready to master every single skill you're going to teach them in writing. But what you're going to find is that if they master even a handful of them, their writing improves drastically. And so that's our goal. So during the group conferences, we're picking out some of the most important mini lessons we've taught. We're checking in to see how they did. So it's where you are going to provide some extra support and really cheer them on as writers with their growth. So that's really important. I don't want you to let fear hold you back. You don't get better at something unless you practice. So if your first a couple of group lessons don't go as planned, it's okay. You can go ahead and reflect on what worked and what didn't and keep at them. Don't give them up because a lot of times when something feels hard, we completely give it up. We want to just reflect on what's working, what's not, and keep doing more of what's working. Okay, I told you I had a big giveaway for you. I know you have some questions you'd like me to answer, and I will be answering those really soon. But first, I want to do a giveaway of some of our writing bundles. So we have these for second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. So in the comments, tell me what grade you're teaching next year for a chance to win one of our full year bundles. If you're not familiar with our full year bundles, this is what's included. There are lesson plans for every single day's mini lesson. So you don't have to think those up because that was hard for me. There are actually mentor text passages that you can use for multiple lessons. There's anchor charts already ready for you, as well as student printables of those same anchor charts. There's task card scoots. There's rubrics. There's the um, prompts for your pre-assessment so much more. So that's what comes in our year-long bundles. We have them for grades two through five. And I'm going to go ahead and pick a few random winners today to win this full year uh, bundle, which is just going to save you so much time. <laughs> All right, I couldn't help it. I love excitement. Jennifer, she says the best grade ever, third grade. I love it when teachers are super excited about the grade level they're going to be teaching. Students can tell. So Jennifer, I'm so excited for you because we are going to send you our third grade writing bundle. Go ahead and send an email, Janie at notsowimpyteacher.com, and we'll get you that bundle right away so you can get prepping for the best year of writing you are, you've ever had. It's going to be so much easier, Jennifer. All right, let's see. I'm scrolling, looking for another winner. All right, Robin. Robin says she's teaching fourth grade this year. Awesome. Robin, I would love to send you my fourth grade writing bundle. Go ahead and send an email to Jamie at Not So Wimpy Teacher, and I will get that bundle to you in the email just as quick as possible so you can get prepping uh, I just know you're going to love it. It's going to make teaching writing so much easier to have all your mini lessons done for you with mentor text and anchor charts. Okay. Awesome. All right. We'll see here. Renee is switching grade levels. Renee's going to be teaching fifth grade for the first time. She's taught third grade for 12 years. Now moving to fifth grade. Oh, I know when you switch grade levels, there's a lot to take into consideration. Let's just go ahead and plan your writing for you. Renee, we're going to send you our fifth grade writing bundle. Go ahead and send me an email, Jamie at Not So Wimpy Teacher, and Renee will send that fifth grade bundle to you. I don't I don't know how many I've I've picked so far, so I'm, I'm just going to pick one more because I can. <laughs> I'm scrolling here. <laughs> um... Oh my goodness, so many of you, so many comments. I'm going to go ahead and pick. How about Ellen? Ellen, she said this is 
but she's going to be teaching fourth grade as a first year teacher. Um, she says she needs all the help she can get. Ellen, we're here for you. It, it is so exciting your first year, but it can get very overwhelming quickly. So I hope that by sending you our fourth grade writing bundle, that writing is one thing you won't be worrying about this year. Congrats um, on your fourth grade position. Send me an email, jamie at notsomebeteacher.com, and we'll send you that fourth grade bundle. Okay. If you didn't win today, um, I'm so sorry. Everyone, everyone can't win every day, but I'm, I'm trying. There's lots of winners every day, and there's even more winners next week. But you can check out our bundles, notswoobyteacher.com slash store. That's where you'll find our TPT store, and our writing bundles are a featured resource. So we have them for second, third, fourth, and fifth, or you can screenshot this slide and use the QR code. Yes, those were some lucky winners to get a year's worth of writing material. And it's just done for you. It's just um, print and teach. And um, you're going to be so excited by your students' growth. All right. We also dropped a link for the writing bundles in the comments if you'd prefer to use that. Or the link, notswombyteacher.com forward slash store will take you right to the store. Or you can use the QR code. Let us know if you have questions about our writing bundles in the comments. And I'd be happy to answer them during the Q&A. Okay, so if you are enjoying these not so wimpy experience trainings, then don't forget to check out our professional development courses. We actually have two of them. So if you feel like writing is the subject that you him and haw about having to teach, and I totally get it because I was me, then you're going to want to check out the not so wimpy writing masterclass where I really share every little detail about how to teach writing so that it's simple for you and that your students will grow and get excited about writing. I'm talking about writers who beg for more time to write. Check out the Not So Be Writing Masterclass at notsonbeteacher.com forward slash yes. If math is maybe the subject you're looking to improve the most this summer, then you're going to want to check out the Not So Be Math Masterclass where we really dive in deep to how to have a chaos-free math workshop with math centers and small group and making it easy for you. So go ahead and check that one out at notsobeteacher.com forward slash awesome, okay? We are just loving working with our teachers in these master classes. Susan said she took both of them and loved them. Erica said she found both courses full of helpful information and tips. Um, make sure you check these courses out. We're really excited we get to, to work with teachers inside of these courses. Amy said she just finished the math masterclass this morning and it's been so helpful. She can't wait to dive into math workshop. Oh, Amy, we're super excited for you. Oh, Beth said writing was a mystery, but the masterclass made it fun. I love that. So exciting. Renee, we're excited for you too. Tara said both courses were the mom. Excellent. Okay, those of you who are playing bingo, if you don't have it already, secret word number three is engaging. Engaging. If you have signed up for the Not Someone Be Teacher Experience, then we emailed you a bingo game board. If you cannot locate it, you can grab another copy at notswoobyteacher.com forward slash bingo. And as soon as I'm done with the live portion of this training, as soon as I get off, then you can comment on this video with a photo of your bingo board. It won't let you comment until after I'm done with the live, but it's, it won't let you comment with a photo. But then as soon as I'm done with the live, you can go ahead and take a picture or screenshot of your bingo board. If you have a bingo, you have five in a row, go ahead and take a picture of it, stick it in the comments, and my team goes through, they select winners, and tag you to get TPT gift cards. So there's still a chance to win today if you haven't won yet, okay? And just a reminder of the next trainings coming up. Tomorrow we're talking about editing student writing. Y'all need to come to this if you teach writing, because editing student writing is kind of one of those things that really, really slows us down. And it's a constant question I get from teachers. Like, how, what should I do? Like, how much should I edit? How do I get them to edit themselves? Um, how do I make peer editing work? How do I do this? I get it all of the time. So we're putting our tips into a short training tomorrow. And then, like I told you, next week's my birthday. I have some awesome trainings for you, but I also have tons of gifts and special promotions and giveaways that you are not going to want to miss. So let me get on here and answer some questions for you. 
If you have questions related to student conferencing or writing bundles, go ahead and put them in the comments and my team's gonna try to grab them for me so I can answer as many of them as possible. How many students in a group and how many groups would you suggest? So this is something we talked about in the training. It's really going to be dependent upon how big your class is and how many days per week you teach writing. So I would have one group per day that you teach writing in the week. So if you teach writing four times per week, then you are gonna have four groups and you can take your class and divide it into four similar sized groups. It doesn't have to be perfectly even, but similar size. So if you have 20 kiddos, then you're gonna have about five kiddos in each group. If you have 30 kiddos, then you're obviously gonna have bigger groups. But some, sometimes teachers get worried about that. Like my class is too big. I only have four groups, but the reality is that your class is too big to do one-on-one. -on -one. And so by doing groups, even if you have seven or eight kiddos in a group, you are still going to make a bigger impact for those 30 kiddos than if you try to do it one-on-one -on -one or just skip conferencing altogether. So a bigger group is better than just not doing it at all. If I use the Not Zombie Writing Bundle, does it matter in which order I teach the genres? This is a great question. On Monday, I am doing a training all about your writing pacing, what order to teach, um, the different genres, how long to spend on the different genres. You're going to want to come to that one because I think that's going to be really helpful for you if that was your question. Um, I don't know whose question that was, but if that was you, you definitely want to be there on Monday. I would say that you can definitely mix up um, and teach them in different orders. But I will share some of my best tips for choosing which order to teach the units um, in your classroom. What if I don't have separate time for teaching writing? I think I really, really, really strongly advise you to relook at your schedule, to talk to your admin, because to not have time to teach writing in elementary school, it is a major standard. Um, writing appears in the standards for all states and elementary schools. So to not teach it, it kind of takes us out of compliance. We have to teach reading writing, math, and generally science and social studies. And so it's just, it's not something we can just choose not to teach. Now I know setting up your schedule is the tricky part, right? There's so many things we're trying to fit into the seven hours, but I would really relook at your schedule. Is there anything that you're doing that is not required, that is not helping you to meet the standards? Um, can you talk to your admin about this? Um, can we shorten transition times? Can we um, teach procedures so that things can move faster in the classroom. What can we do to get those minutes? Because it's really important we teach writing, not just because it's standard, because our students need it. They're going to need it in junior high, high school, college, and career. How much time do we schedule to teach writing each week? Great question. Um, I think you need at least 30 minutes, four days per week. I like I like five days per week, that's great. I love 45 minutes when you have it, but aim for at least 30 minutes. 30 minutes will give you time to do a 10 minute mini lesson and 20 minutes of independent writing. And I think that you're gonna see big growth if you can teach, have teacher writing workshop for at least 30 minutes. Do the students provide constructive feedback to their peers? Yes. Um, I think this takes time to grow. And I wouldn't expect it at the very beginning of your group conferences, but students quickly start to model what you do. So if you are giving constructive feedback and praise, pretty soon your students will be ready to do the same. And so you might notice some groups are ready earlier and they start praising each other and offering some feedback. And to me, that's, that is a goal inside of our conference groups that it's, it's not just me. I want to be doing the least amount of talking. I want my students sharing and I want to hear other students at the very least praising something in their work. And so they will model you. I like in the first month or so of group conferences to be really showing them how to praise and how to give that constructive feedback and then start asking them if they have any. Like, Does anyone have anything they want to say now that Michael read that paragraph to us? I just think don't expect it right away, but keep modeling it. Um, do you need to give them time to work on the task before you meet with them? I would do your conference right away. And then if your conference is only 10 minutes, they can go back to their seat and work on their task. But I would consider your conference to be very important. Um, also, if you get back to conferences and they share and you realize they've got this, get them back to their seats faster. If there's like one or two students you need to give support to, it's okay to let other students go back to their seats. What are the other students doing while I'm conferencing? They're writing. 
Um, it's writing workshops. So they're writing. You give them any lesson with the task and they're at their seats or wherever you allow them to write, writing while you meet with the group. And it does take teaching procedures and practice a lot at the beginning of the year in order for your students to be able to do this independently. But it's that independent, it's that task you give that's so small and based on the mini lesson you just gave with examples that allows them to be more independent. If you just say, go write, yeah, they're going to come back to you. You're going to have students all the time like, I don't know what to write about. I don't know how to spell this. But um, if you're giving them a very specific independent task that takes about 10 minutes and is totally based on what you just taught them, they tend to be much more independent. Plus, when you teach procedures, one of the days we spend is how do I solve problems for myself as a writer? So we go through what are the problems that are going to pop up? So what should they do if they don't have to spell a word? We talk about that. What are you going to do if you can't spell a word? We put it on the anchor chart, what they should do. What are you going to do if your pencil breaks? What do you do if you have to go to the bathroom? And we help to solve the problem before it pops up so they have no reason to interrupt us. And display that anchor chart. We also have them put it in their student notebooks. Do you give students your conference notes or is that just for you? Generally, conference notes are just notes for me. I don't take super detailed notes only because I don't have time. But um, jotting down when you notice a student might need a follow-up, like, um, if you just notice, I want to check in with with Charlie in a couple of days or, you know, something like that. I have to write those things down. I, I won't remember otherwise. Um, I would blame it on age, but I would never remember it when I was young either. So I jot down small notes just for myself. When should I start conferencing? Right at the beginning or do I wait a week? That's a great question. I love this question. I would start conferencing after they have written their first draft which happens very early in the unit, but we'll do a couple lessons on planning and a couple lessons on drafting. When their draft is done, that's when I would start conferencing. I feel like conferencing earlier than that isn't a good use of their time because they don't have writing yet to share. It also gives them a few days to get used to their independent writing procedure and routine and that stamina that you've worked on building before you start conferencing. The problem is that some teachers are like, I'll start it next week. No, maybe next week. I mean, next week, and they keep pushing it back because they're a little worried or scared that it won't work. We got to set the date in your calendar, circle it, put a star on it. And um, I would start just about as soon as they're done with that first draft, which is probably a week to week and a half into writing. Um, and that gives you enough time to also score their pre-assessment and just decide on the groups. If you tried to conference a little earlier, you might not know, um, you might not have graded that pre-assessment yet for me. I can only grade a few a day. I don't sit down and grade 20 writing samples at the same time. Do you divide groups by skill level? Yeah, you wanna divide groups as best as possible. Like I said, you're using that pre-assessment. You're not gonna overthink it, but as best as possible, you want them to be um, divided by skill level just because it will help you to better serve everyone in the group. If you have one who's a really struggling writer and someone who's a really more of an advanced writer in the same group, they're Again, not getting their needs met and being differentiated. It's just like whole group where you're mixing all the levels. In the group, do students take turns sharing the small section of the writing and then listening to all the others? Yep, exactly. And that should be really quick because you're not asking them to share very much. No more than a paragraph. And in fact, a lot of times, especially at the beginning of the year, they're really only sharing a sentence. Okay, you know, we learned about leads a couple days ago. I want everyone to share their lead quick around the room, around the circle, around the table, whatever it is, share their lead. If a learner has missed our sign conference day, do you try to make it up? Um, generally, no. Uh, if they've been, if they missed a day of writing, it's probably better that they spend time writing when they get back. I can always do a desk site conference with them after my group conferences to make sure that they're on track. But here's the, the thing to remember. Every student isn't going to master every single skill and that is okay. And um, sometimes we think it's all or nothing. It's like, oh, you know, this is hard because if a student misses, they won't know it. So I'm just not going to do it at all. And that hurts everyone. When a student is absent, it, it, it does hurt them, but their writing's still improving, uh, even if they don't learn that one skill from the day they were absent. But I do like to stop by, especially if a student's been absent a lot or has uh, someone who's repeatedly absent. I want to check how they're doing and make sure they have some confidence. But having them join a different group probably isn't the best use of their time. I'd rather have them writing. Um, do students do one masterpiece per genre? No, they generally do two masterpieces, actually. 
I purchased the third grade writing bundle last year, but I'm teaching fourth <laughs> this year. Can I use the third grade bundle? Yes. Actually, with our writing bundles, if you're going up or down a grade level, I would say that it's okay. The difference in the grade levels, they still have almost all the same types of mini lessons because really the standards don't change. If you've looked, um, third grade writing, fourth grade writing, they tend to be very similar and they tend to still need all the same things. They're just getting better and better at it. They're getting stronger at it. Their vocabulary is getting bigger. They're, um, they're trying more things. But um, the reading level on the mentor text changes, the task cards change, um, the examples on the anchor charts change. So if you're going down a grade level, you might find that the mentor text is a little above their reading level. It doesn't mean you can't read it to them just like you would a mentor book um, to provide that kind of support. It doesn't, you could give them the passages and read to Coral read together. There's options if the passages are a little too difficult, but you can also use mentor text books if you prefer. Do you have any advice or suggestions to set up students to work independently? We talked all about independent writing yesterday. So make sure you go back and watch that training because it's going to really help you. Whoever asked that question, make sure that you head back to that training because I think that's what you're asking about. We talked all about independent writing and how to get students to write independently. Um, so you need, you're going to want to watch that replay on our YouTube channel. Will this training be available to watch later? Yes, they're all available. If you have you signed up, Go to notzombieteacher.com slash experience. Get yourself signed up. We send you we send you the replay links every week, but you can also go to our YouTube channel to watch replays. So yes, they're all available later too. Okay. If you're interested in done for you writing lessons, we already did it for you. Head to notzombieteacher.com forward slash store to check out our bundles. Also, if you want a more in-depth training on how to teach writing workshop where I'm going to cover every single thing from finding the time to your mini lesson to the independent writing to the group conferences to grading and sharing and celebrating. Make sure you check out the writing masterclass and you can find more information about that not so teacher.com forward slash yes. Um, that that course will have you leaving feeling like a confident writing teacher. Like you just know exactly what to do this year in writing. Okay. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about editing student writing. So can't wait to see you. Have a not so wimpy day.